you're listening in Radio Land, we welcome you to join us on DBS Facebook page. The show is live. There's a visual over on the Facebook page. You can see beautiful JL on the Facebook page. <laughs> she looked up like, yeah. So <laughs> we are about to start. I, I was told we have to do it in exactly an hour this evening because we have a special broadcast after Bio Out Loud. Okay, so JL, my famous first question which famous 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 yes first my famous, <laughs> famous first question it always get me going because people tend to have a real answer and i don't have an answer for that question but what is your earliest memory when did you know there was a jail joseph in a body and you're alive in this universe Ooh, that's a good question um i was three. Oh wow i was three that's my earliest my earliest memory and um and I think it's so distinct in my mind because um, at three, I visited Canada with my mom and my sister. And I remember various aspects of the trip. You know, I remember interacting with my cousins. I remember um, all of the cabbage patches. I remember, you know, like I remember a lot of really significant things that my mom always used to wonder, like, how do you remember those things? You know, so I would, I would say three when I really, um, I really got a sense of who I was. I know people would always tell me, I'm a tea madam. Um, I knew all of the, the, the songs in church. You know, when, when, when church songs would come on, I would probably sing off, off beat. I, I doubt I did though, but um, I knew all of the songs and um, I love to, to dance in the church, you know, and that was my first earliest memory of myself. Wow. You see, that's why I'm always in awe because I don't remember life until maybe I was 13. <laughs> like, like, okay, well, I remember little, little things, but not 13. I'm, being, I'm exaggerating, but before seven. Really? I Girl, still I remember don't have every real. single birthday party my mother had for me. Yeah. I remember people who came to my birthday parties. I remember who would cut the cake with me. What? Lesson. And I probably two. My parents took a lot of pictures. My dad took a lot of pictures when we were young. Um, he had one of those old school cameras. You know, you had to go to 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 get it developed and uh, the film developed. Mm -hmm. And and he, but he loved taking pictures. Um, and we had a lot of pictures growing up. Like to this day, I have a lot of pictures of my childhood. Um, so I think that probably reinforced things and and force me to remember certain parts of of my life um but i you know i remember all my i my first best friend was when i was like was i was probably three or four mm -hmm. um and we're still very good friends to this day you know like so i remember all of these yes. these things so my, my 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 from from my childhood days from preschool i remember preschool rapture time preschool in portsmouth at the time it was called I remember my teacher, Miss Ernie and Miss Glenda. Um, I remember a lot of things. I don't know. I I just <laughs> I just remember them. I remember you know doing um during like I know well I remember later I remember later on that that was what was actually going on. Yeah. But it would have been you know every time during carnival they would have like almost like a a, a retreat mm -hmm. um and you know we'd spend a lot of time in church i guess it was their way of not not allowing or forcing young people to to stay in church and not go carnival yeah. so your parents would tie you <laughs> under their waist and you'd be in church the whole time and i just remember as a young child you know always being in church with my mom um and then later on when my dad started back going because my dad was in church he left he came back he was well, we'll get we'll get back to yeah. your parents. <laughs> okay, so what village are you from? So I am from Vegas. I am from Itasi City. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I grew up on Lambert Street in Vegas. Um, our house is still there where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, I my neighbors were people like Nikima, Roye, um, the Prime Minister. Um, these were uh, Father Sharpless. These are like notable people, I would say, mm -hmm. who are my neighbors. Like when I say my neighbors, like are right around me. You know, like you yeah. didn't have to go far. You know, you could borrow sugar from. <laughs> That's how <all> close. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. 
I, I recently had um, some stuff to do in in Vekas, so I, I can I can now visualize Vekas. Before this year, I would not have been able to. So I kind yeah. of know where you're talking about now. <laughs> okay, yeah. and who 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 are your parents? So my mom was a Victoria Seaman. Um, uh, later on, Joseph and my dad was Aurelius, aka Aurelian, aka Ninja, aka AJ. <laughs> Aurelius Joseph uh, from Vegas. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So and my mom was originally from Penville. Okay. And my dad was more or less Vegas grandfather. Yeah. I, I said when I went to Vegas, I literally said to the person who took me, I don't see no big difference between Penville and Vegas. And he said, don't let nobody hear you say that. Girl, because don't let nobody <laughs> hear you say that. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. Yeah. I mean, over the years, I think, um, I, I, I wouldn't say that things have changed. But may, things may have changed. But when we were growing up, when I was growing up, my dad always had a very close connection with Penville. So a lot of his closest friends were from Penville. Um, my dad taught at some point. Um, he was a teacher. He was a principal. And he, um, he had a lot of friends from Penville. And because my mom was from Penville, too, we knew a lot of people from Penville. So in those days, there was no back road going the other way that w- through Suf- um, Cold Sufria and coming oh, into... Oh, that's the back road? Yeah, that's a ba- that was actually the back that's, road. That's the road I know. Right? <laughs> so the, 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 road, the road would take you through to Vegas uh-huh. and that's how you'd go to Portsmouth. So Penville, people from Penville drove down that route. So on, on Saturdays, my mom would get her vegetables from Penville. You know, her family would drop off vegetables and fruits and stuff for us um, when we were growing up. Um, so that was the route that people took. And, and even when, you know, we would take the bus, when, if we came into town and we would take the bus to go back to Vegas, we would more than likely end up on a Penville bus because people like Theo, who's a bus driver from, from Penville, that was my, my father's, one of my father's very good friends. Um, so we'd go on either Theo's bus, you know, or, or one of those buses from Penville. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. You see? You always learn something new. And it's just so crazy that I just, 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 just had my Penfield Vegas experience. <laughs> okay, so you you said that you grew up in a household where your mom and dad were both there. So just tell us a little bit as to what your childhood was like with both parents in the household. Um, With both parents, I mean, it was a normal, I would say it was fairly normal growing up as a child up until I became a teenager. Um, my my dad, it seemed he always wanted to have boys and he only had girls. Uh, so he raised us like, uh, they used to call us the little ninjas. <laughs> so he was the original ninja and we were the little ninjas because we knew how to do like everything. My father taught us plumbing. He taught us electricals. He taught us how to change the roof. He taught us how to paint. Um, he taught uh, us how to make fish pots. We knew how to swim very early. Um, like anything that you would expect like like young boys to be taught growing up, my father would have made sure that we knew how to do that. Um, his motto was row your own boat. So he wanted us to be very independent and he kind of forcibly <laughs> instilled that in us. He's like, you're going to know how to do everything. Um, and, and that was like what it was like really growing up. We were supposed to go to school and get really good grades. We're not allowed to have 70s. And, and when we get 70s, I would get blows. Like, so we were not allowed to, to, um, to party and, and go out and these kinds of things. Our, 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 our community was mostly the church. You know, that was mostly what our, 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 our community was, the church and our neighbors. My mom at, at different times was a, a district nurse. So, so she worked within the district in Vekas, um, and you know, in those days, I don't know if it still remains, but as a district nurse, you're on call 24 hours. So I, I witness people having babies on our steps. Mm. I witness um, people coming in really bad accidents. I witness like people's 
inside outside i witnessed quite a few things growing up we had a big medicine cabinet at home um so she learned she taught us how to stitch ourselves if we got a cut she taught us how to to do these things um um and then my father at some point started doing a lot of fishing um so we we grew up like not eating like chicken we grew mm -hmm. up eating like a lot of it. chicken was like like a rare <laughs> thing yeah. for us we used to have to beg my mother mommy please make chicken on sunday and she's like why wanna make why would i make chicken when we have fish so it was fry fish and fry fish boiled fish and stew fish all kind of fish <laughs> big yeah. fish she take off the bone bone in bone out all kinds of ways you know to make it interesting sometimes she'd put coloring in it and i mean it was just it was that was that was life growing up i mean we had a really good um we lived in a very good neighborhood where everybody knew each other. Everybody, you know, interacted with each other. Um, whether you looked up to the person or, you know, the person would help you with your homework or whatever it is. So, like, like what I mentioned, like, right behind our house was Father Sharpley's, um and his family home. And if my mom wouldn't, um, wasn't able to come home in time to make, to make lunch for us, you know, um... Martha, who's Father Sharpless's mom, would cook for us, you know. The boss would drop us off, would pass, and she'd say, Oh, Victor, come in omelette, you know. So we knew we'd come and we eat by her. You know, that was the kind of relationship, you know, we, we, we had um, with, with our neighbors and stuff. You'd play hopscotch in the yard, on the road. The guys played a lot of cricket right in front of our yard, you know, and that was what it was. <laughs> so you're very much accustomed to the community knowing your business kind of thing. Yes, knowing everything yes, that's going on even yes, knowing when it oh wow you know, yes. th that's a really new aspect to me but just hearing you talk about it it sounds like you were raised by your community um what what school what primary school did you go to before we moved to secondary school so i did a year a year two years in vacas primary school i did two years and then after the first two years my mom moved me to portsmouth so i went to what is now called um roosevelt, roosevelt douglas? douglas okay right so i at the time it was called uh government. portsmouth government school. school okay right so i went to i went to portsmouth government school i remember my first teacher was mr pear <laughs> the principal <laughs> Listen, I, the present principal yeah, mr pear was my wow. first teacher um and then um i had mr pear then i had miss aaron um and then they sk they had skipped me, so I didn't go to grade five. Um, so I had Mr. Pear, Miss Miss Aaron, and then Miss Cornelius, Jane Cornelius. JL, so those are my teachers. <laughs> you letting me know that Mr. Pear have age. Mr. Pear look like a young spring chicken man. <laughs> I'll have to trouble yeah. him tomorrow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Hmm, good to know. Okay. So what high school did you go to? And then I went on to PSS. PSS. So um, I did first form to fifth form in in PSS. Okay. Um, yeah, I thought you were a convent girl, actually. No, but no. Actually, I was registered in convent, you know. I was registered at convent because at the time my grandmother was moving back to Dominica. And she kind of, she wanted company. <laughs> um, and she lived in Rose. Well, her house is in, is in town. But um, my mom didn't feel like she wanted me to be so far away. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I ended up going to, to and it was like a last minute thing. So I, I got a scholarship to go to, to, to high school mm -hmm. and it was like a last minute thing. We're going to just, you're just going to go to PSS because it's close um, and you take the bus every single day and commute. So in those days, um, you know, we had bus drivers like Michael and, and I think at one time it was uh, the bread bus from, 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 from Penville that was Clement, Clement Master's dad yes. used to be our, our bus driver at one time and then. And then later on, it was Michael, yeah. and that's Michael later. Okay. So those were my way. That was my commuting back and forth between Portsmouth and Vegas. We had Clemens on the show before. No? Yeah, we were. We yeah. grew up together. So my mom and his mom were very close from childhood friends growing up, um, and Clement is one month um, younger than me. No, you're just so, telling out everybody so, aged tonight. So he, <laughs> so he, um, so my, I always know when my birthday comes, his birthday is a month after plus one day. So, so we, we, so it was Clement, people that I, like I really grew up with that you would know would be Clement Masley, um, DJ Spawner. Um, DJ Spawner was my first 
best friend and we're still friends to this day from great mm. from preschool um we sat next to each other straight through um and uh people like dr uh cognet um marie Co um marie cognet that is medallia um th those were like my my friends marie teres marie teres etienne who's the registrar you know these mm. are like the people that i hung out with in school you know some of most some of the others have moved on and you probably wouldn't know them but these are the people that i you catch me with um during my my school days <laughs> okay i'm just trying to get some of the juice that people wouldn't know about you before we, <laughs> before we get into the deeper things um what is your worst and the best memory in high school worst and best. my worst yes Oh, your high school was just Boy, a breeze. High school was so much fun. Oh, wow. Like, worse? We didn't have worse in PSS. Like, for us, PSS was like, okay, so the, the, the highlights of PSS was when you decided you're no longer going to church, but, you know, they had, like, this thick place they call the Guava Bush where they had a group of, 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 of I would call them evangelist students who <laughs> would go to the guava bush and pray and stuff. And, you know, you were your little rebel self. You would take kicks on them and, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. And we were very, PSS, we were very competitive in sports. So net, playing netball and stuff. We, 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 we looked forward to going to Rosa and massacring those Rosa <laughs> people <laughs> in sports. And when we'd come down, we would have, we'd sing songs like, like I remember once we won, we won, I think it was against grammar school, and we came down singing, Moche de Osukuya, Ofama Gotete, like we were like screaming. There was no like bad times. <laughs> bad time. PSS was such a like a fun, like we had at the time, Alpha James was the principal, and he, I mean, he was very strict, but we didn't care. We were, we do what we want, and you know, I, so I don't have bad memories. I just had like, I have a lot of good memories you know yeah. um going to i mean we got away for a lot of stuff you know that we probably shouldn't have gotten away with but it was always fun times you know people like christine and and you know uh Marsha malone and all of these like we, we didn't really have bad bad times in in school you know school was School was fun, and we, we couldn't wait for recess yes. for for Miss Joyce to bring our our juice our and, and, Joyce. and boy, let me tell Miss you, Joyce. and our and our bread and and tuna and, and, and potted meats. Listen, <laughs> that's good. No, very often you have people on the show, and they will tell you when I went to school, I had to go to school without shoes. I didn't, you know. So it's nice to hear sometimes, you know, somebody else have like really great childhood memories you know even school and i never know. really felt deprived um yeah. growing up um I, we had a lot of family overseas uh so although my mom you know they, my parents struggled from time to time but i never felt like i was wanting certain things mm -hmm. you know um i remember one time i had like how many pairs of school shoes <laughs> like i would pick every friday to wear and they were all yes. platformed my mm -hmm. grandmother used to send me those platformed because i was short well i'm still short <laughs> i was just about <laughs> to say <laughs> <laughs> and and i and i and my my skirt was always long in the front and short in the back because i had a a big yeah. behind mm -hmm. right so i liked wearing the platform shoes because they they somewhat balanced my front <laughs> Um, so but other than that, you know, like school was just, I mean, we were, there were times when we didn't have money to pay bus and, you know, you'd bum a ride because, you know, it's on the one fan and, you know, your parents don't have, don't have the money to give you and uh, bus drivers. I remember bus drivers that, it's funny though, Julie, it's like remembering the bus drivers that shamed you when you were a child growing up and like seeing them today. And I remember all of them and they think I don't remember them. Like I remember every single one of them who would shame us. And we had this thing, my sisters and I, we knew how to like hop off the back of a van, a moving van. Mm -hmm. So we would, because of how the, the incline was when you got to Vekas, you know, you're going up the hill. We knew how to stoop down really low and just jump off. And the, they would never see when we leave. They would just realize we were not at the back of the Vekas. I could never even now ride at the back of a van to go up Vekas. <laughs> never. That was the life. Hey, yo, I fell off a van, you know, once. So I fell off a van once in Tibo. And the v driver didn't know I fell off. I fell. I, the only job, when the van made the bend. 
I fell off and greasy all my hands, my foot. And thank God, no broken bones, you know. I ended up going back. I mean, he felt so horrible. I actually ran into him the other day because he doesn't live in Dominica anymore. And I tell him, you remember when I fell off your van? <laughs> Somebody <laughs> says it's called bail off. Bail off. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. That, that, was, that was it. <laughs> that was what we did growing up. I mean, we knew how to do. I remember getting bombing ride from Portsmouth. And we would get, would get off school at 3.30 knowing good well that if we miss the four o'clock bus we're going to be stuck in Portsmouth and we would stop off in Bourne to pick mango and let me tell you <laughs> let me tell you we would pick my and I would eat I mean that's where my mango day started <laughs> I would eat mango until I would get diarrhea <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and then we would wait for for vehicle for, for bus from then and bus is not going up so we'll probably end up getting like a van that probably carrying um material you know like sand and we'll be <laughs> sitting down on top of the sand and when you reach makers you the color of the sand all your clothes <laughs> your <laughs> shoes everything everything dirty and my mother is like well you come out and we're like well you know we stop and pick mango <laughs> <laughs> and no mango to produce for her because no, we eat all the mango she could get she, all the stains on our clothes but we that was a life but yes i get that <laughs> and you know i know that's something that you don't want to talk too much about but i have to touch it but um you you would you were never worried about somebody taking you and going with you you know and you say oh i need a ride up you know that kind of thing no the things that we worry about so much with our children it was not something that it seemed like we had to worry about before so i i i i am very in two mind to ask but i really wanted to talk about a little bit about the whole culture of young girls being touched and that kind of thing quickly just your mind on it i know you're a public figure and it's definitely something that we have to address in our community <coughs> you know well well first of all um there were attempts made mm -hmm. Um, but we were, we were raised to be so vocal, like, uh, like for one that there was a saying that was used on me a lot when I was a child, you know, they would always say, I'm so loud and, you know, and all of that. And my father used to be like, leave her, let her be loud, which was kind of strange, you know, for him to be like the one can, he would put me in debates and things like that. But we were always taught to have a voice, mm -hmm. right? We always, we were always raised that way. And my mom, being a nurse, always taught us. When I was 12, she gave me a book, The Complete Twin, uh, which talked about everything that was going to be changing in my body. And how, and mark you, I started seeing my period at 10, right? So she was kind of a little late on giving I, me I'm the book. I'm sure you never said that anywhere before. <laughs> Probably, you said your, probably your period. I don't. I'm just like, trying to get things you've never said before tonight. Okay, <laughs> but ahead, but but I remember her, you know, really coaching us and and sharing with us, you know, how we're gonna take care of ourselves and you know the good touches and the bad touches and and not to trust anybody regardless if they were uncle, nene, power, sister, husband, child, like anybody could potentially cause harm to you. And I remember a very close relative of ours had tried something, right? And he was like, oh, um, oh, do not tell your father. And I was like, I'm going to tell him. And my father was known <laughs> as the ninja, as rightfully said. He had no shame in doing what he had to do and going and sit down in the jail. Like my father spent many weekends. I, I, I've seen my father many times in the cell, right? He had no problem chasing after somebody, bursting somebody teeth, drinking rum, breaking a bottle and I'm like, he had no problem with doing that. Right? Um, and when I said that, it just, there was cease and decease. Like, it never continued. Yeah. Um, the person actually went on and tried it with another one of my, and she did the same thing. Right? She was like, you know, like, you're, like, you're not gonna tell me not to tell my parents. Like, why are you telling me not to tell my parents? You know, like, what are you, what are you doing? If you think, if you felt what you are doing was actually not harming me, why you don't want me to tell my yeah. parents? Yeah. Right? And, I mean, my father was known to be wild. <laughs> So, so he would, he would probably have killed the guy, God forbid, you know, you never yes. know what could have happened. But we were taught to be vocal about these things. And, and if it would have ever happened, God forbid, that if it had ever happened to any of us, um, I think hell would have probably frozen, froze over because, you know, my, my, my father would have reacted in, 
in probably the worst possible ways. Um, so in those days, like it wasn't a, it. it it was happening around us. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be, you know, naive and say, you know, it wasn't. It, I know of people it was happening too, but I feel my parents really protected us, and they really like shielded us, and they really talk, spoke to us and told us, you know, um, don't let nobody take you for your delicate zeb. You know, like things like that. We would, you know, my mom, <laughs> my mom would say and and stuff, and and you know, make sure when you like, my mom always wanted us to like get married before we had sex and all of that. That didn't happen, but still, it's like, <laughs> but you get the point. It's like yes. she always, like you know, really admonished us and, and sh- told us, you know, um, you know, this is what we're supposed to to be to to get and in life. And and I remember, you know, at one point, you know, my mom thought I was having sex, and and she asked me, and I told her no, I wasn't. She said, you know, I'll bring you to the doctor and I'll make them check. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like she said that to me, and I said, well, make make them check. We had a really good relationship yes. with our mom, right? And I think she was like, she was really, and it wasn't just us. A lot of people in the community can say they had a really good relationships with her because in as much as she was very quiet and reserved, she would not judge you based on what you do in your life. She would just always admonish you and, and tell you, you know, and guide you and tell you, Hey, do this and do that. And if you're going to have sex, make sure you use protection. And if you're going to, you know, make sure you do HIV testing and all of these different things. And I remember the, the, the first time I did end up having sex and I, and I, and I told her, um, and she, she gave me the, she gave me the stats. Cause at the time she could have given me stats on the rates of STDs or, mm-hmm. or, or the amount of people in Dominica that had STDs. And th- and yeah. when she told me that, I was like, you know what? I'm not doing this again. <laughs> I'm not doing this. I've done. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, in terms of being like being abused and stuff, we, we, I, I, I can say that I, I was never, I was never subjected to, to sexual abuse, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, and, and if, if it had happened to me, um, my parents, I know, would have taken a stand against it. Yes. Um, these were the kinds of people they were. Um, I don't see a lot of that happening today um, where parents are taking a stand for their children, whether they're lying, they're telling the truth or whatever it is, but but taking a stand for their children. I think it's it's so important to raise women who are very much aware of how how it is to feel protected. Mm-hmm. We were a little overprotected because uh, we were too protected to some extent. But looking back, I am like, you know what? I'm glad That's that well, yes. that it was how it was because it really made me the person that I am today in terms of what I will be willing to accept or what I won't and how sometimes I can detach myself from situations and be like, yo, I know what love is. Bye. Mm-hmm. You know? Yes. <laughs> like, no, it's, like it's so important. you don't have to cut style on me, okay? Yeah, yeah I know my words. Full Hello, stop. yeah, you hey. know, and I must say you're one of the lucky ones because we we live in a community where maybe every three women has gone through that um, ordeal. So it's definitely you're lucky. You're so 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 lucky, and. Um, I want to read some comments very soon. So I'm going to come and check the comments. Uh, I know people are normally leaving things there. So say praise the Lord for that. And it's something that we deal with a lot in our foundation, in my foundation. So just having a woman as a public figure, I really wanted us to talk about that. So I hope I didn't make you feel uncomfortable. No, no, no. I just believe that people should, you know, speak up. Don't be afraid. To speak up for your children. Don't be afraid to investigate. Get to the bottom of it. You know, just because sometimes, sometimes it's a call for attention. Sometimes it's a, it's, it might not have gotten to the point where. And if you just let it slide, I, I, I feel like so many young girls are, are growing up and, and feeling that, you know, they, there's nobody to protect them and they're falling into relationships with, with animals. Sorry to say, mm-hmm. you know. 
who treat them like they think they should be treated, but it's actually not the best way. And and I was, you know, fortunate enough to be so protected as a child that, you know, I had my prerequisites. I was like, I want a man that can cook because my father could cook. You know, I wanted a man that can cook. I wanted a man that, like, I had, like, what I wanted, you know. You know, my father was a bit rough, so I knew I did not want a rough man, you know. And, and, and I was able to make make those things known that this is what I wasn't looking for the rich and famous so I was just looking for somebody that was going to respect me protect me and really ride and die for me you know that was what was important for me um in a man you know and thank god god bless me with one who mm -hmm. who is just that you know yes. so yeah okay so I said last week that I really wanted to talk about ex-cons and abuse and that kind of thing because we everybody look at different aspects of lent but i really want this lent to be about forgiving yourself forgiving people <coughs> who have harmed you and a lot of women haven't forgiven themselves or they hold themselves responsible you know as opposed to saying you did this to me or a lot of women they're afraid to talk about it you jokingly told me in a previous conversation that dominica needs a svu yes <laughs> special we need a special unit. victims unit <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's law and order. But no, that's um, yeah, it's that's no, that's people's court. I watch oh. too much um, oh, I crime. You should have the same tune. No, the same tune. no, that's not the but same. <laughs> that what the tune I bust out there was people's court. <laughs> But we definitely need something to protect our women, protect our young boys, protect our, we just do. Protect our people. We do. So. We definitely do. Um, I don't think the police can do it. They can do the yeah. work. I don't think they're, first of all, I don't think they're, they have enough training for that kind of work. Um, and that's just how I, I've seen it. I mean, I'm not trying to, to, to throw shade for yeah. no police officers by any means whatsoever. I just don't think that that is what their role is yes. you know specifically they need a specific unit that deals with just that somebody who's who's gone to school for psychology or whatever it is you know that they understand human behavior they understand when certain people behave a certain way when children yeah. answer a certain way what they really mean you know like they can read the signs and those kinds of things um i think that is what we we probably would need and it doesn't even have to be a big unit it could just be a unit that works you know um hand in hand with the welfare division because we do have a welfare a social mm -hmm. and welfare division in dominica um so they can work you know um, collaboratively with them and and to do proper investigations and know who the perpetrators and are exactly and take them off the street <laughs> and take them because a lot of them driving bus they okay, they um, they walk um, you know, in. You know, my show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I thought it was on J. I thought it was on my shoe. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no. Bye bye. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. So, uh, when you were in high school, did you know what you wanted to do? At any point, you thought I want to be a journalist, or no, anything you've accomplished right now, you <coughs> thought this is what you wanted to do. What what you wanted to be? Why I, I always school? wanted to be famous. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to be famous. I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> I always wanted to be famous. Um, I I really w there were a lot of things I wanted to do. At one point in time, I wanted to be a pilot. Then I wanted to be a dentist. I then I wanted to be a, 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 a well, I was wanted to be a movie star. <laughs> uh, psh, like I like I just always wanted to be something else. And and I've dabbled. Um, I actually over the over the last week, I was talking to somebody and I was telling him I've lived three successful lives yeah i've lived three lives because in w and one lifetime i worked as a medical esthetician and a cosmetologist you know like like i had a life doing mm -hmm. that i w i lived a life on radio being like a radio personality and having a show and doing all of these things and now i'm like i live in my third life yeah. <laughs> i'm living my third life right now so yeah it's just i i have always considered my I feel like I'm a sponge. Like I can, you can say, Julie, you could say you can do something and you want to, you, let's say, jail, let's do this or whatever. And I'm like, damn, I could probably, we could probably do it like this. Cause I like to like tweak things mm -hmm. and create things and make things different and stuff. And I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm a creator at heart. I think I'm a creator at heart. 
I come up with an idea. I'm really good at naming things. So naming businesses. I've named quite a few businesses. I'm not going to call their names. Um, I've named, you know, I'm good at coming up with names for 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 businesses, for for events, for parties. I have friends, you know, all over the world who reach out to me and say, "Hey, we're thinking of having an, a party. What what, yeah. what what should we call it?" You know, um, I'm I have a knack for that. You know, for for creating. You know, and and seeing things through and being like really good at putting things together. And, and that was that is actually my superpower is putting these things together. You know. Um, but but nothing specific. Okay, so let's talk about your three lives quickly. Cosmetology, how did you end up in that world? Boy, so I was supposed to be in dental school. And um, the funds were not f- funding. <laughs> the funds were not funding. So I told, I told my mom that I would, I would stop that and go into, into something else. I would go and work and stuff. And... I start. I well. I moved to Toronto, and then I started doing. Um, I started liking like cosmetics and makeup mm-hmm. and stuff. And people always used to be like, "Oh my God, I love your makeup!" Like my friends who are like, "Yo, all my friends where, that I grew up with in Canada are all famous, eh?" So if probably if I had stayed in Canada, I'd be famous, famous too. Already. <laughs> but they're all of them famous. As a matter of fact, like one of my friends, she was in a Code Eight. You know that movie that just came out on the weekend? She's in that movie. Like, mm. like all my peeps are doing really wonderful things. Yeah. So big up to them. But um. All of them, were, all of them, these were the crew that would be like, Jill, come put my makeup for me and whatever. So I'd always be doing that. And then I decided, you know what? I'm going to go to uh, cosmetology school. However, breaking it down to my father that I was going to cosmetology school was very difficult. So I had to come up with the highest heights within the cosmetology framework, which was medical aesthetics. Mm. And I remember calling him and saying, and I'm going to do medical aesthetics, which is essentially like laser hair removal, all of these things mm-hmm. like um, Botox, etc. And he says to me, you're going to do aesthetics? I said, yeah, you're going to clean people's foot? You know, and that is what was just like in his head. You know, that, that, that just stayed with him. And he was not happy about that. Anyways, I went on. I did my my certificate program. Um, I completed with flying colors. Um, I went at, on to work uh, for a, for a, pharma, a chain of pharmacies as a cosmetic manager. Um, so I used to manage two stores, and then I went on a cruise ship. Yo, I've, yeah, like I went to England for six months, and, and I went to to on a on a cruise ship. Didn't stay long on the ship, and and then I came back down to Dominica because at the time my mom was ill and I was like you know what I'm gonna come down and that's when I got into my second life which was radio yes so tell (laughs) us about that so getting into my second life which was radio um I I always had felt like I could do radio um and as a child, DBS used to actually call our house for news up from the north. And on a few occasions, you know, I ended up giving the news and stuff. And, you know, so I always felt like I had that knack for it. I did mock parliament. I did a lot of, you know, of the, these kinds of things. And always doing, presenting in church. Always, I was always Duvan. And so when the opportunity came up, it was Big Ben, um, who was my very good friend in Canada, he was like, oh, uh, th- this radio station might be looking for someone, you know, whatever, but let's let's see how you would think because I wasn't supposed to be there for a long period of time. Mm-hmm. I was just passing through and I did a couple shows with him. They loved me and I ended up on Q. <laughs> that is how it happened. Um, I did apply other places, but they were not interested and years later, they came up and I was like, no. Nope. <laughs> Because I I hold I don't hold a grudge but I so hold a grudge, <laughs> and those nose are normally so glorious, listen so gracious. But so <laughs> I know those nose. Yeah, I remember somebody <laughs> calling me and they're like, "Come on, work for us," and blah blah blah. And I was like, "No." They're like, "Why? You're not even considering even if we pay you." I'm like, "No, not even if you can pay me three times because you turned me down that very first time For no because you didn't." Reason. So it's no, leave me alone. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my Lord. <laughs> and now I don't know if I should say that you're an author, entrepreneur, because like, what, what do you, how do you see yourself presently? Are you an entrepreneur? Well, I'm still an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. I will always probably be an entrepreneur. Um, this, we're, I we're on this life now. In this life, <laughs> yes. I focus more on 
on content. content. So I'm a content creator. Um, so a lot of my life revolves around whether it's documentaries, whether it's um, sharing stories, whether it's sharing my own stories, whether it's doing my own shows that share stories, mm -hmm. whether it's being a brand ambassador that shares stories. Mm -hmm. But I consider myself a content creator now. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your documentary. Um, one of your friends, or a mutual friend, she told me about it, and she's very much passionate about this thing. So she's passionate about the Carib territory. I think she's more passionate about Kalinago the Kalinago territory. Ter okay, let me let me let me rephrase. Thank you. She's more passionate about the Kalinago territory than she's passionate about Dominica. <laughs> And she, I had to learn the whole idea of Kalinago, not Carib, you know, like, because outside <coughs> of Dominica, we still say Carib, you know, we, yes. the, the, the education hasn't really left the shores um, the way in which we would prefer for it to leave. So just tell me a little bit about it, because we are running out of time and tell me, you know, why you did it, what, what was the objective, what was the final, the end game and everything. So my, my master's degree was um, in media production. And I had to do a major research project. And that would entail any form of me, ut utilizing any form of media um, to tell a story mm -hmm. or stories um, with a research paper. So it, a research paper would have, act, would have accompanied that project. And um, I couldn't find it within myself to do anything that was that was grounded in Canada you know although I was in a Canadian school and all that it was just I just kept wanting to go back home I was like looking everything that I was looking for was Dominica related and stuff and um at that time right around that time was a lot of civil unrest where you know there was a lot going on with um with like George Floyd and all of these different yeah. things and and I and I started thinking you know about the amount of oppression that black people have gone through and I realized yo that wasn't just the start of it you know like there's the root the root problem is how we dealt with our indigenous people and I started doing a lot of research on papers that were done on the Kalinago people of Dominica and a lot of it I I felt were were um seen through the white gaze you know a lot of it was written based on, i mean there was some local context um one done from from local dominicans um, but a lot of it was done you know with a white gaze and when i say white gaze what i mean like obviously um a lot of exoticizing a lot of oh my god these you know these exotic people and and and, and i kind of wanted you know their own story like i wanted them to tell their own story because sometimes as an outsider we come in with our own ideas on what we want um and not let them share their story and it was literally me telling them here's your here's here's a camera tell me your story it was literally this right um i did a lot of research i did about research for about 10 months in in the community you know um gathering interviews speaking to people virtually in person as it was right around covid time you know um and then i decided on who the three characters would have been um and and then with my team so my team comprised very small team that was Naja Thomas um uh Norris Francois Shelon Kazimi uh we would go up to the Kalinago territory and we would would film and um after that was all done, that is when I really started to write my paper. And what I saw, like, the, the, because when you do, when you're doing research, after you've gathered all the information, although the information was, was done in the form of, of a, like a vi videotaping interviews, a videotaped mm -hmm. interview, right? So it wasn't a documentary yet. It was a videotaped in interview. I started to code and I saw the different themes that would come up and, out of that came a lot of uh, conversations about the land and about the language, you know, and um, and I kind of just saw something there. And, and that's how territory came about. And uh, reluctantly, my professors, after I did my master's and everything, I got my certificate, my, my degree and whatever. I was just like, okay, the end. Because that was initially, that was really yeah. initially. And my, my professors were like, girl, no, you need to submit this to festivals. And I reluctantly submitted it to three festivals. It got nominated 
in one, it became an official selection in another, and it won Best Documentary in, in, in the third. Uh, so Best Short Documentary um, by the Caribbean uh, Tales International Film Festival. And, um, you know, I've used this story to kind of share, you know, Dominican's story uh, from, from an indigenous perspective. Um, I think... I did. I think I did a fair job. I mean, I want to say thank you again to the community, you know, who allowed me into their homes and into their lives to share their story. And I hope I did did it, you know, justice. I, I let them tell their stories. I had, I didn't ask. I didn't put nothing of me in it. Not even my voice, you know, because being somebody that is known in Dominic, I could have easily, easily said, you know, I'll narrate or I will, you know. Mm -hmm. I really wanted it to be their story told as they wanted told. And, um, yeah, it's available now on, on my website, blackislandgirl.com forward slash documentaries. And just last week, you know, it was mentioned in, it was mentioned in the Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> so, hello, I got a, you know, my shameless plug. It was <laughs> mentioned in the Rolling Stone. And I, and I've seen quite a great response, you know, in the amount of downloads, um, over the last four days, we've had quite a significant yeah. amount of interest in the documentary. It's only 24 minutes long, uh, but I feel like it's a really powerful piece and it should be in Paris this summer um, at a festival in Paris. It's going to be featured, um, one of the featured uh, films for the festival. And, you know, that's pretty much it. You know, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I could do some work in, in a yeah. community that I love, that is dear to me and... I want to continue to to really uplift the Kalinago community. All right, so congratulations on that. And um, on behalf of Bio Out Loud, I love when women do great things. Okay, so of course I love stories, hence why I do Dominican stories. And of course my path is totally different from yours as to why I'm doing Dominican stories. But do you see yourself doing stories? I know you already do shows where you do stories, but do you see yourself doing a documentary piece on Dominica itself, the the Negma War and that aspect of it, because you're trying to get my. You're trying to <laughs> no, I'm not getting your creative juices going. So oh. I'm actually working on a documentary yes. right now, um, um, and I I will not say a, I will not talk too much about it yeah, as yet. You should not. Uh -huh. um, but it is it is it is another Dominica story. Okay. <laughs> it's another Dominica story. Okay. Um, and. Um, we'll see what how, how it unfolds. Okay. For me, I usually I treat everything like it's research. Mm -hmm. So I capture everything as is, as if it's research, and then I sit with with everything. Um, and I literally people think that I go through all of the footage and whatever. So I listen to it. So it's okay. the, it's my air is what I use. So I would tell you. I said no, no, send me send me all the audio. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd send me all of the audio and whatever moves me is what we roll with all right so we have uh, seven more minutes so let's see how, if we can do a speed round what do you love about tattoos me yes. <laughs> <laughs> tattoos tell a story they my all my ink tells a story yes so they they connected i love ink um i have lots more to get um it left to me i would probably have my entire ne neck for my for my neck <laughs> down done left to me um as a professional woman how hard is it well i know in canada it's so simple to have tattoos everywhere people do not really care but when you're dealing in the caribbean as a professional woman do you tend to have some there know, probably is there probably i remember when with my piercings <laughs> i remember my piercings one person like high in society said something to me about my piercings and i and i and i i responded i mean i I'm very sharp with my tongue, so I will respond accordingly. And I don't think that we, you can judge me based on, on my piercings, or you can decide whether or not I am going to do a job. I know even in jobs here in Dominica, some people tell you, "Oh, you're not allowed to wear a piercing or or nail polish, or you have to be conservative." You're here. I feel like you you should be able to be yourself. Um, and thankfully, you know, um, coming from a Canadian system that those those things actually tell how creative you yeah. are so people actually look at you and say oh 
you're you're one of those you know yeah. you're you're an out of the box thinker you're not boring and you're not so they and they love that okay. and, oh my God. and yes and that is yes. how i will get jobs yes <laughs> i will yes. i will get jobs am i interested in us dollars or <laughs> easy yeah. dollars yeah yeah i get it I, I totally get it okay what's your favorite color who um my kids will probably say purple they would probably say purple, but I would probably say black. <laughs> okay, hear this one. <laughs> Kako tea or lemongrass? <laughs> Kako tea with lemongrass. Kako tea. Boy, you, you greedy. You, you know, I think that's what Clement but said But it tastes also. good. Lemongrass tastes good in Kako tea. I think that's what Clement and that's what Jody said. Yeah. Kako tea with lemongrass. But I was just chopping you about Kako tea. Yeah, uh, I, I had a whole show called Kako tea. I know, that's why. <laughs> Clearly, okay. green bananas or dashing? I would say dashing. Dashing? Yeah, I would say dashing. I'm a dashing leaf. Dashing leaf. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I didn't think about that. Dashing leaf. Okay, I would okay. say dashing. Okay. Um, this is a country or town? I want to ask you country or town, but I feel like you would. Uh, Vic has be considered country. Country or town? Country every day. Because some people during during Hurricane Maria, Boje, they were greedy. Country every day. Because, <laughs> you know, if you were in country, you know you would have gotten something. Yes. What is one thing JL Joseph cannot live without? What is one thing? Wow. That's a hard question because, because I'm very detached. I probably could not... I, what is if you're saying thing thing mm-hmm. um i can live without things <laughs> i can i can live without things i mean people you follow me on social media you see me i can pop down sometimes i'm popped up sometimes i'm i can live without uh, people probably i would not be able to live without so i would not be able to live without my kids and, okay you know my my family and stuff you know okay but things uh, all right so okay let me yeah. see if i can get this one too Ooh. Would you be able to? How long would you be able to live without a mirror or any reflective surface? So you cannot see yourself. You cannot tell if you have something in your eyes, in your nose, in your teeth. How long would you be able to live without a reflective surface? If you follow me, last week I was asking about removing a kakani. <laughs> if if you're if you're in the presence of people, I would be able to live without a mirror. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, oh, I would definitely oh, wow. be able to live without a mirror. Okay. And and then and then you know you could see yourself in people's eyes. You know, look deep ah. into people's eyes. Mm. I love how deep that went. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, mango or bananas? Mango. Today, somebody come and ask me for mangoes. If I have mango. Mango, mango <laughs> every day. Mango? My favorite mango. My I like mango. I like grafted. I like uh, grafted wrong. Mango. Okay. I like mango. Um, <laughs> Lika. I like, oh my God. I'm, I am a lover of mango. We pass in anywhere and we see mango and we're like, Okay. So today. that question that came from um, Bella. Bella said you cannot live without mango. No, I ca- I probably <laughs> cannot. I you know what? I can live without mango, but if mango is around, mango would not be able to live without me. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think your purpose in life is? Um, my purpose, mm-hmm. um, to be the voice for the underdog. You, but you don't consider yourself an underdog. You just think that you're no. But I, I antagonistic and I, I don't consider myself to be an underdog. But I don't like to see people taken advantage okay. of. So I will, I will speak my mind and pay for it later. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mr. Joseph would want it no other way. Your father. Well, if he was alive, he probably would. <laughs> he probably would just shake his head. <laughs> okay. How do you want to be remembered? How do I want to be remembered? As a Black Island girl? Nah. Like as a G. Black Island girl, big. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the Dominican public is pretty lucky to have you. As I said this evening, we have to wrap up um, on the hour because we have another special presentation but thank you so much JL for being here with us and the final question of the night is what is next for JL Joseph who this year I'm taking it easy um, this year I've decided to kind of you know uh, try my best to work in a lot of collaborative spaces 
um, I've I've decided to slow down a lot and let things come my way. Um, I see I've I've networked a lot. I've spent the last year networking. I've met some really 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 amazing people, um, and. I, I always said, you know, 2024 was going to be the year. Mm-hmm. So I feel like the work that I put in, I've done the work. I have the paper. I have the experience. I have the accolades to prove it. Yes. So everything will just come naturally. So so I, I'm just going to let God, you know. That God yeah. and I told my friend, 2024 is the year for more. So I wish you more blessings, Thank more you. life, more Thank successes, you, Carla and more Verdi number and ones, yeah. more everything that you and what your parents aspired for you and what you aspire for yourself. Thank you, thank you, and same to you. I, I, I always, you. I normally say to people, I wish you what you deserve. Yes. Thank you. You know, I Thank wish you, you what you deserve because sometimes we wish people good and they're not really wishing us good, you know? <laughs> so if you if you deserve good, my girl, you're going to get it. Yes. <laughs> yes so I, I wish you what you deserve. All right. Thank you. This was another episode of Buy Your Out Loud. And I know you wish we would go into more and hear about her childbirth moments and stuff. And I really think that we should do that because I like how expressive that you are. But yes. we cannot do that this evening. <laughs> but <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> to be continued. Thanks Thank for you. having me, Julie. It was lovely having no worries. I a conversation it. here with you. All right. Thank you so much for listening to those on, in Radio Land. Thank you for listening to those on Facebook. Thank you for viewing. And until next time, I'm Julie Robertson. And don't forget to love. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.